Oh, welcome, welcome. You just entered the trading pit, your home for sophisticated analysis of the crypto markets. It's February 22, and here in the studio is JJ and Ben Amin, Benjamin of JLab. Sorry about that. As always, I am your host, Marconi White, and we're going to dive right in today's top story. Believe it or not, it's not even crypto, but it's highly related. NVIDIA earning, earnings lift investor sentiment. The futures of technology sector heavy NASDAQ composites outperforming other major benchmarks following upbeat quarterly reporting from NVIDIA. And just to give you some idea, NVIDIA reported top line revenue at $22.1 billion versus estimates of $20.62. And revenue was up to 265% year over year. Man, scorcher. Now, this morning, as we look at the pre trade, pre market, NVIDIA is trading at 674 as of yesterday. It's now up as I look at it live, around 761 in pre-market activity. So JJ, what does NVIDIA's results mean? Is it a go time for risk assets like Bitcoin? I think we're gonna have to wait to see how today plays out. So ultimately, like you said, it's just blown out expectations to the upside. If we now look at it year to date, it's almost a double, which is insane. It basically doubled on a double on a double throughout the past year. So it's kind of getting to this point now where it's extremely overextended across multiple time frames. We have kind of the quarter one close coming. So I think it's natural that we we'll see some profit taking in the video. If not today, then probably throughout the course of the next week. And as we mentioned on Tuesday, uh, the video and just NASDAQ stocks in general, are basically to BTC what BTC is to alt. So you kind of see this risk appetite heightened for people who are in these stocks because all of a sudden they have more discretionary capital that they can put into higher risk assets. So naturally that flows into BTC. Uh, we see a nice jump from it. We saw that yesterday it was trading around uh, 50,700 or so at time of earnings, jumped right back up to around just below 52,000. And now it's kind of consolidating back towards the lower end of the range. So it really depends on how the market reacts today. If we see some profit taking here, BTC will likely follow to the downside. Um, that said, if it continues to rip, goes above 800, I think we could see new year to date highs for Bitcoin, but it's, it's a wait and see scenario. We saw some outflows in the ETFs yesterday. So just waiting to see how it plays out. Well, that's, yeah, definitely interesting to see how that plays out and interesting to see this tech stock having such a big impact on, on Bitcoin and the rest of the risk market. I guess, you know, investors look at this as technology sector in general. Uh, Benjamin, I want to ask you, I'm looking at some of the pre-market data. It looks like some of the stocks are also getting bid up. Things like Terra Wolf and Riot. Uh, Coin maybe is a little bit flat. It looks like some there is some interest going further down the risk curve. And I saw overnight that uh, on the crypto side, AI just went gangbusters. Uh, just, I, I think I was looking at a coin market cap. Coin, the, the market cap for AI cryptos was up 8%. Trading volume was up 24%. So do you expect higher risk plays to receive some tailwinds from this announcement? Yeah, it looks like everybody is directly going for the beta place instead of the main place. So uh, it took so much time for ETH, for example, to start uh, trending upside with respect to BTC. ETH, BTC is up in a good way. And BTC is basically consolidating in a 2 to 3 percentage range. There's nothing much happening out there, which once again pushes out flows into um, highly volatile assets, such as Onto Finance, Alt, Eigenlayer, and yeah, AI tokens are continuing to do the narrative anyway. As long as NVIDIA keeps performing this way, basically the AI tokens are working like a proxy uh, to that sentiment. That's why you see WorldCoin is also, for example, up a lot, mm -hmm. despite being a horrible token economic play. Right, I mean, so much of supply was basically airdropped, and there's no right. economics in there, and yet it it basically works as a proxy to Sam Altman. Yeah, yeah. I, I, all of this is narrative based. We were talking about offline for all those folks who are here. Uh, just the ability for these narratives to catch fire and to take off with you know what what is traditional. What we would say is very little fundamentals. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't make a lot of money there. Uh, it's hard for anybody who's looking at a sophisticated take to make any recommendations around them. But certainly from a meme perspective, there's something there, right, Benjamin? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So fundamentals are not the biggest factor when it comes to these AI tokens. It's just a narrative. And 
as long as there is a push from KOLs and all the other mediocre market makers that AI plus deepen is the narrative to push forward, then you know the flows are continuing to come in that regard. And yeah, absolutely. Can make well, the I, argument I, fundamentals haven't really mattered since pre two thousand eight in any market. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, we're, we're we're gonna go down that one that 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 rabbit hole. Um, we certainly could, uh, but but I, I do want to bring us back to talk a little bit more about price performance because there has started to been a little bit more chatter around a pullback. You guys have talked about it on this show a couple of times about expecting some kind of larger pullback uh, before the having. I've seen some some talk online um, uh, with a couple of larger trading accounts talking about somewhere in the forty two to forty five k. Then we had Mike Milvgratz who went on Squawk Box. Um, he was talking about he was also expecting some kind of pullback in the 45 to 42k range. And JJ, yesterday, I think we we saw perhaps the first dent in the ETF narrative coming out where the flows perhaps were negative for the first time. There may have been some redemptions. So from an ETF flow perspective, what are we looking at? Are we starting to see a slowdown in momentum? Well, yeah, I think yesterday there was 35 million plus of outflows. And I think some of that was to be expected, like we were discussing a week or two ago with uh, the Genesis estate. They were cleared to sell their GBTC. So naturally, that kind of has a dampering effect on any inflows that are coming in at this time. And it's also natural, like we see profit taking. Like if you look at this chart, we're kind of clearly on resistance here. It's not just going to break out of this Bollinger Band right away, go straight to 60K. It's going to take some time consolidation as of now 50k is still holding so that's it seems like a solid range if it can keep that base but as we also said the market's hedging for this too like the market's well prepared uh currently it's well positioned for a drawdown so i don't expect it to be too severe at least in the short run i think uh we probably see like 47 48k work as support in the case that 50k does break uh provided it's not some kind of macro related event here in the near term but it's just it's consolidation which is exactly what you want to see after a large leg up we haven't broken out of that 52k resistance yet which wasn't necessarily expected so i think this is a welcome cool down benjamin i want to pivot over to you from an altcoin perspective let's say we get down to that 48k range what do you think is your is your expectation there i mean obviously we're, we're seeing it, it's a smaller move on the btc side but all these narratives, are they just going to nuke when we're under 50K? Yeah, if we if we go under 50K, I think we'll see a solid nuke across the board on altcoins. And right now, the total three is sitting around 540 million, I think. And I'm sorry, billion. And I think it will drop down to 500 billion if that happens comfortably. Mm. And I think that would be a buying opportunity still. Yeah, actually, I, 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 I want to bring that up. Yeah. We had a question here from uh, people in the chat. Uh, this one came from Lenka K. Guys, do you have some insights on this? I was looking at the ETH DeFi space. Those tokens are just absolutely smashed still. For example, Uni, uh, Comp, Bay, Ave, CRV. Is this good beta play for ETH right now? I, I'm going to I'm gonna step out on a limb here and say, listen, we're, we're still expecting a pullback at some point, right? Uh, rather than looking at any one of those specifically, I think you you would say, wait for that pullback to happen, see where the price lands, and see if there's ones with good fundamentals that are seeing adoption, users, et cetera, that, that, could, that are then good buying opportunities for the rest of the bull run. Benjamin, would you agree with that? Yeah, I'd agree about that. You know, we need to see where this lands um and what type of a correction basically comes in because we are not doing more than 20 percent each corrections since nearly 500 days now so that's a long term uh you know that we have gone through without a solid 25 percent each correction of sort mm. so would we do another 20 percent each correction now or would we do it potentially after 15th of march or towards the end of march close to halving that's a bit hard to say, but there is definitely an expectation out of it. We are also seeing some amount of perpetual FOMO happening across the board. Where, uh, since the prices are keeping up well above 50K area, which is above the golden fib ratio as well, there is a lot of FOMO factor and everybody is starting to feel that missing out um, you know, sentiment. If this will run to 60K, am I missing? 
the 10k move which is worth to take it because we have broken through the trend but i do believe we will test uh, test around 44 to 46k at the very least um a steep correction would be to 42k and we have to see if we lose 50k comfortably and if we do not see coinbase premium come back i think we will see 44k at the very least so you're looking at a, a weekly close below 50k you're looking at the premium not coming back as convergence that we're going to see a steeper yeah. decline okay so i think for all those who are looking for better buying opportunities those are going to come uh, that, let's transition and talk a little bit about the markets. Let's unpack them before we do. David, Sean, Adrian, Lenka, Paul, thanks guys for joining us. Hit the like and subscribe button. Share this with anybody you can, your brother, your sister, your mother. Put it out there on the Telegram channels. Put down on the text chains, Reddit, wherever you're reading this stuff so you can get more people into the mindset of sophisticated traders. Glad to have you here. I know there's a question coming in from David asking, is Pablo... Pablo continues to have some impact on the market since we have big players in the game. That's a question we're going to unpack as we look at the market update. But as we do, JJ, I want to turn it over to you and ask the question, uh, as we're looking at price action this morning in pre-market before New York opens, spots sitting around the 51K level. Tell us, are there any signs right now that that sub 50K is imminent? No, nothing jumping out in particular. We're just going to have to wait to see how these inflows or outflows go. It's basically just been the driving factors, whatever the New York session does. The rest of the market's been following it. So we'll have to see if that bid returns now that kind of the risk on sediments come back in light of NVIDIA. If it holds its leg up, keeps turning higher, I think we will see some positive inflows. But it's really just dependent on what the New York session does here. So we're just waiting, watching the Coinbase order book. So, you know, if we see some green volume candles here to start pushing the price up, but nothing jumping out yet. It just seems like we're kind of waiting to see what happens now that we're back at 51K. Has that turned into support or is it ultimately a resistance level that's going to send us below 50K? Yeah, I, I, similar messaging, I think, week to week, day to day. What, what about from a whale side perspective? We haven't looked at that in a while. Are the whales still accumulating spot or have they have they paused kind of in this no man's land? No, they they've still been buying. So I tweeted that out yesterday. The uh, whale divergence chart. I'll pull it up here as well. And these are just larger wallets, so it may just be ETF related, right? We don't. We just know that these are wallets holding greater than 10k BTC. So obviously, mm -hmm. it's likely that the institutions are included in that. And as their inflows continue up, these are going to continue up as well. So it's just more of a confirmation of what we've been seeing from the inflows. But it's obviously just been persistent since that 41k level. It's just nonstop accumulation here from Wales, which is obviously extremely bullish long term. Okay. Well, I again, I, I think the difference between the trader and the investor is important to uh, point out here. It's certainly, I think 50k you could argue is still a good entry point if we're expecting much higher all time highs in the next 18 months. If you're looking at more entries, you know, from a from a trader's perspective. JJ, is this still a time to have hands off, kind of sitting on your hands a little bit? And I know yeah. we'll get into trades a little bit, positioning a little bit uh, later in the episode, but I just want to ask that now. You think of risk reward, like in the short term, your upside is probably capped at 55 to 60K max, and you're really betting on like an extreme overextension to happen in the short term in that scenario. So it's kind of like an outlier scenario, maybe 15 to 20% that we get that high in the near term. As mm -hmm. opposed to the downside, you're looking at like a 42K target, which Benjamin threw out anywhere between 42 and 47K. So there's a whole lot of risk there if you were to enter this position, if you're just looking to scalp it, you know, if you're not yeah. looking to hold it forever. If you're looking to hold it forever, then obviously basically any price below 100K is probably good. But <laughs> in terms of uh, yeah, like... The, it's all the, about your horizon. It's yeah, all exactly. about your horizon. Think in, think in terms of generations if you're an investor. If you're looking at it on a one to two month timeline, you'll probably get a much better opportunity than current prices. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's let's move over and let's look at the perps a little bit. Um, because I, I know Benjamin, you mentioned that they're starting to look a little overheated. When I looked at the volume, it was about 13.9 billion. And it looks like the longs have now increased. Uh, whereas last time we I think we were looking at it, the shorts were actually a little bit higher. So about 54% long to short ratio. So uh, JJ, what is that telling us? Are, are are people starting to get ahead of themselves, thinking that the the worst is behind us and they're not really prepared for a correction? Is this more 
of that carry trade that you've been talking about? I think it's partly driven by, well, the carry trade was mostly the shorts here. So that I think we're, like Benjamin said, we're starting to see some overheating. People enter, entering directionally long positions on perps as opposed to this, which was mostly driven by the carry trade where they're long spot, shorting perps against it. Now we're just starting to see some overheating. Prices remained above 50K for so long that people don't want to miss out. They want to get that long exposure. So I think we're probably due for some kind of pullback um, in the near term, but we'll just have to see. Basically, today's going to be pretty pivotal, I think. Okay. Benjamin, you want to give any color there relative to some of the uh, signals you were seeing? I, I, again, you mentioned sort of this overheating. Uh, I think you, you were saying open interest was increasing. That was give you a little bit of caution. Yeah. So if you look at generative AI open interest, uh, it's been bombarding. Of course, after last night's NVIDIA uh, earnings release, uh, token prices shot up quite significantly, and there was a little bit of OI discharge. But it, it clearly shows how much of a you know uh, bullish sentiment it is on the generative AI section. Uh, that is something to be cautious about, even though you can speculate and gamble over there. But that is an <laughs> over-leveraged situation that's definitely coming up over there. Um, so if we get a discharge, or let's say in, a, in the next quarter, or there is some other bad news comes in or NVIDIA decides to tank for some reason, I think we'll start seeing a beta move on AI tokens on this side as well. Yeah, so I, I think that's a, another cautionary tale where we're talking about the um, just just the the fragility, if you will, of these memes, right? That you can ride them high, but they're susceptible to news events in a way that perhaps uh, results shouldn't be. You know, yep. so, so something to really keep in mind. You have to be in and out for sure. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I do, I guess, JJ, anything else from a perps perspective you want to offer here? I know it sounds like we're a lot of wait and see as we're waiting for the market to open, start to give us some signal uh, if we're going to start seeing a sell-off. And it looks like we're, we're waiting a little bit there and the market has opened, but I'm not sure we're really seeing too much activity no, yet. Price is just kind of staying at a standstill here. I think we right. have a PMI coming up in about 10 minutes. So that should drive some movement in Dixie and we might see. I thought it was out of the, no? No, I think it's at 9.45, so like 12 minutes. So waiting for that, and then we'll see probably a risk bid up or bid down based upon whatever that reading is. Yeah. And that'll kind of give us a flow for the day. Well, when we talk about up and down, that's actually one of the great ways <laughs> that you can play options. We're going to talk about options now. JJ, I want to get your perspective on the market from an options perspective, seeing if we're, any, if we're seeing any different positioning. Before we do that, for all those who are out there who haven't considered giving options yet, this is the time to do it. We've talked about uh, offline. I, I want to tell you just yesterday, JJ and Ben Lilly and I were talking about what could happen with this liquidity Armageddon in the next couple of quarters. We've talked about this several times on this show. We're not going to necessarily get into it right now. But as we're talking about that, it, it really just comes to mind how important it is to be prepared for these moments. And so knowing how to trade them, knowing what you're going to do, what you're going to be looking for on your screen and the plays you're going to set up. And if you're going to do that, options can be an amazing play. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But if you haven't done that already, I suggest you look at Coin Call as a great way to play those options. It's a great exchange. It's got a beautiful, elegant interface, and it's got about... There's a link in the description, helps our show, helps you out. And again, I, I say it all the time and I can't mean it enough. It's now is the time to start doing that practice. So when that fat pitch comes, you're able to swing. All right, let's 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 turn over. I want to talk options, JJ, because when I was looking at some of the activity today, last time that we talked about options, we were saying, listen, the market's kind of positioning in either direction, right? They're buying some cheap put exposure, which is cheap insurance. And they're also looking to be hedged so that if, if we see... A, a move above that 53K, they're going to be able to profit either way. You were talking offline about the fact that they're they're starting to buy up more expensive put options. Um, so what does that tell you from the way the market is positioning themselves? It wasn't necessarily uh, more expensive put options. It was just that they were becoming more expensive. So into like NVIDIA earnings yesterday, we saw the put premiums return on one week and one month dated options. So they really saw a large spike up in terms of like what you're paying for a put that's out of the money versus what you're paying for a call that's out of the money. So we really saw like this uh, desire to hedge from the market. 
and that's coming up on tomorrow's expiration. So we see there's a lot of 52K puts expiring tomorrow, uh, 50K puts, et cetera. Like you see all these uh, large purple lines here. These indicate put open interest. So we see there's over 2,700 BTC worth of put options at 50K. So that's kind of the market booking profit by buying these short data put options. And they're just going to see what happens over the course of the next day or so. But they have that hedge in place. So on any drop here in the next couple of days, they're prepared for it. They're, they're hedged. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of been the ongoing thing is people are really buying up shorter dated options uh, across different expirations. So we just see this put to call ratio dropping or the call put ratio. This indicates more puts entering. So this is for the March 1st expiration. And we see since, uh, let's see, since February 19th, there was 4,457 puts opened. And now that's grown to nearly over 6,300 at present. So there's just kind of, and that you can find this across all these short dated expirations. So if we look at March 29th, basically the same thing here is that there was 30K puts opened on February 19th, and now another 2,000 or so of these longer dated puts have been added. And it seems like they're buying short dated put options expiring within the next month and then loading up on out of the money calls that expire later in the year. So if we jump out to say June, we see this huge, massive out of the money calls 55K, 60K. 65k it seems like that's their hedge they're buying shorter data put options preparing for a move lower which they'd probably just add more call options in that scenario take the profits on the puts and then they're hedging that with deep out of the money calls in case we do get that really expansive move up above 60k what's the what's the risk there if any right i mean i guess is, is it really just that we hang out at 50k where everything yeah. kind of <laughs> yep right we just get data burned Market makers just keep the price in range. <clears throat> you don't get any expansive move in one direction or the other, and you're just burning burning time premium. So they may be selling like some shorter dated stuff to hedge that, and then they collect it. Like say, you sell in the money calls expiring within the next week or two. You use some of that premium to buy puts, some of it to buy calls, and that kind of hedges your risk exposure a little bit. But mostly they're just betting on the fact that it's unlikely that we stay at 52k 50. 50 to 52k for very long they're kind of expecting an expansive break in one direction or the other within the next month i want to i want to bring this up to to all those who are asking for some predictions you know going through the youtube influencer ecosystem you see a lot of work on well these price targets right there's not enough discussion about how the sophisticated market maker players which sit on the massive amounts of capital are, are making their bets right so yeah. when they when they are looking at this, they don't actually know the direction. They, as you just said, right? They're they're buying some near term puts for some downside exposure, but they're also prepared for the long term, right? So basically, they're telling us, listen, in the short term, we could go down. I've got my insurance ready. If we do, it's relatively inexpensive. Otherwise, I'm going to keep my my capital, and in the long term, I'm going to profit. This is the way that the market is positioned right now. Exactly that. Yeah. You profit no matter what the market does. It's kind of a beautiful right. thing that options afford you. And you look at where we are, like it's kind of an obvious setup to hedge. Because if we do break out from here, you know, 60K plus becomes a target. If we fail, we could see as low, we return to the 200 day moving average. That's over a, whatever that is, almost a 50% move, 40, 50% move if we drop back down. So it's high, it's high likelihood we see some volatility continue over the course of the next month. It seems like that's what they're speculating on. Yeah. It's just that uh, it's unlikely that we just kind of watch paint dry in this range for very long, right? It's already sure. been a couple of weeks of that. So the longer that we stay here, the the more you're on borrowed time of an expansive move happening in one direction or the other, some decisiveness coming in from the market. Well, decisiveness often happens for our friend Pablo. And we had a question here that I mentioned before from David C., is Pablo going to continue to have some impact on the market since we have big players in the game? Benjamin, I want you to answer that question. But just so you know, your friend and compadre, Ben Lilly, already put out some commentary. He said, we haven't seen Pablo active in a post-ETF environment. Cur curious to see what happens. His last signal was down 5% within a few days. So, Benjamin, uh, you know, I want to ask you, what are your thoughts on Pablo? Is Pablo going to continue to play an outsized? Or is it really going to continue to be a good signal where the market's gonna gonna go and then beyond that are we starting to see new signals like for example etf flows or some other signal that's going to really give us better indication in this post tradfi crypto ecosystem benjamin you should give a little bit of the background lore on pablo too for people who aren't familiar <laughs> imagine a guy sitting in a it's somewhere smoking his cigars <laughs> 
Yeah. So Pablo is a pattern of wallets which we have been tracking for a long time, I think since 2017 and 18. Um, so it definitely has a lot of exchange connections, moves around a lot of money between hundreds of wallets sometimes, and then aggregates it and then sends it to multiple exchanges. Also collects from multiple exchanges. There has always been rumors about uh, who that entity is, and is it an exchange? Is it a third-party veil? And why is a 5,000 BTC move so significant on price? And why do we care about it? So this, th these have been a few questions that constantly come across our desk for years together. It's not new. We've gone through two, two cycles already actively in the market, and we get these questions. Um, we don't know who this entity is, we're not sure. And there is definitely shift in patterns depending on regimes. Sometimes there's a lot of silence. There needs to be overstretching situations where he makes a move. That's what we observe as. Um, that's why often it times up with a few good tops and sometimes it does not. And if there is silence, then yeah, there is silence. Um, but the way I interpret is that it, I do not know who it is, but the way I interpret is it is probably even a head of a signal group or uh, someone who knows something and is signaling to someone using such moves, you know. So, and that's why others take action. This is probably not information that's only known to us. Some others are also taking action as a result of it. And hence, you see the significant drop in price or increase in price, however it could be. You know, There's also buying activity sometimes from it. But when selling activities are dominant and when there is con consistent activity, consistent valid movements, then significance comes in. Otherwise, in a bull trend, it is often difficult to take in the impact because a lot of that selling could also get absorbed if there is enough demand. But if there is exhaustion and when you get such selling pressure coming from him, then the compounds, because a lot of people who he's signaling for, or including us and our community of people, right? Like all the hedge funds who work with us, the family officers and other hedge funds who work with us, even they end up taking a short portion or buying a put or you know taking an insurance policy against it or selling mm -hmm. some spot holdings. So this creates a ripple network effect as a result. And that's why, you know, like <laughs> we call him the Pablo, uh, the, uh, the network effect that he has is what is more significant than the amount of BTC actually moves. Okay. So, that's, that's, yeah. that's good background. So if, if I heard you correctly, it's ne not necessarily in a great signal or, or an easy to discern signal as we start to have a bull market, uh, but it can definitely be an outsized move when things are a little slower. Is that a, is that a simplified? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, For example, so right, right now in, in, in a two week sideways, if we get, uh, let's say a 10,000 BTC move come from him, that is going to be damaging. But mm -hmm. if we are putting up a $2,000 candle on BTC and you get a move from him, uh, I think you can pretty much ignore it. So it's probably a take profit type of a situation. Okay. So, so there you have it. I think the question of whether or not Pablo is going to have a, a strong impact, it's, it's a little bit of a wait and see, but it's also waiting for, uh, I think the market to settle down a little bit. I think if you see those ETF flows start to, to trickle off and we started to see a little bit of that perhaps yesterday, the momentum died down and perhaps we hit more of a, a, a small bear period, maybe a three, three month period or quarter of consolidation. Maybe Pablo is going to be a little bit more indicative or a little bit richer signal. Um, okay. So, you know, you know, for all those who are out there, thanks for joining us this morning. I think the, the, the market continues to say, let's see what, what it's going to say next. We're waiting on some information on, on whether or not we're going to be able to clear the 53 K at some point, or we're going to drop below 50 K from a trading perspective. And actually that may feed in, uh, come out from the way that the Dixie plays. So JJ, when I was looking at before, it looks like the Dixie again hadn't quite broken down, hadn't quite broken up. What's your take here on where Dixie's sitting and its its ability to do some real wreckage 
in the risk on markets. It's actually been looking quite weak. So what I'm really looking for is a breakdown below the 200 day moving average. Uh, it did temporarily earlier in the week and then it bounced back. You see it's kind of consolidating around this crucial 50 hour side mark again on multiple time frames here. So let's pull up the daily chart right on 50 RSI on the weekly and the daily right on uh, right above the 200 day moving average, which is around 103.75. And I think if we lose that, it really opens up the gate to possibly fall and retest the yearly open levels. So that's really what I think the market is waiting on in large part to see if Dixie can break down from here. It's been looking weak over the past couple of weeks. So it's fallen from those highs pretty strongly, it failed to break out above 105. We'll see if there's kind of a catalyst coming up in the next week or so that can really plunge it lower. When you say catalysts, uh, jobs numbers coming out, um, obviously there could be some events we can't forecast at all, but is there anything in your mind that you're looking for in terms of telegraph dates that may, may be that catalyst? There's nothing specific. Uh, I was looking at the market watch calendar. There's no really like, major, major events coming up. So it could just be an offhand comment from a Fed official that sends it lower. You know, it's kind of spin your wheel and pick uh, whatever narrative the market <laughs> wants, to, wants to jump on to devalue it, then we'd be happy to see it. But it's still wait and see for now. Uh, it obviously looks much weaker than it did early in February, which is a positive sign. So it's just a matter of can it can the 200-day moving average continue to hold? If it doesn't, I think that's opening us up to return to the yearly open levels, which would obviously be very, very bullish, and that could probably provide the fuel we need to go up to 60K. So it's the uh, same with Bitcoin. It's just wait and see. I think if we see that move above 53K as DXY falls lower, that's probably a good sign that we're heading to 60. So nothing nothing that sticks out. One, one point I do want to make that it's kind of – Starting Everything to, like you're looking at now, it just keeps saying this is the best time possible to hedge, right? We have this huge yeah, overextension. Right. Could it go higher? Sure. Could it reverse back? Sure. It's it's just kind of a 50-50 a scenario at present. Yeah, but that, that's not even us just saying that. That's what the market is saying. That's what the yeah. market is signaling with the options activity. Nobody knows. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, We're all but, in the same boat. I, I, what, what I find fascinating right now is this need to wait and see, which is the exact opposite of being in crypto, which can move, you know, years in a day. Right now, it's it's about wait and see to really build that patience. Patience is the word for 2024. Absolutely, yeah. That's where your best setups come. You know, like you'll you'll see the it'll be obvious when it's there. It's not obvious right now, so you're better off just waiting it out. As nerve wracking as that can be at times, you feel like you're going to miss out on something. You, you Long term, you'll be much better off if you just hang out patiently and wait for things to become obvious. Well, I, I do want to talk about positioning and some of these setups that may be there. Uh, before we do, we had a question. Benjamin, I want to get your get your take on this from Andrew. It says, what is the probability of a so-called left translated cycle where the BTC blow off top happens in the beginning of the bull market this year? And then we we only go down from there. Yeah, this theory has been coming up quite a lot and trying to understand what is the basis for it. So uh, the earlier in January when we had uh, a situation like a blow off top, uh, the the fear we had was that if ETF, is ETF sell the news, if the GBDC unlock of nearly six hundred thousand BTC is basically going to offset. Um, you know, the, the token supply, the, the BTC supply cut that we are going to see as a result of having. The, the fear was not about whether BlackRock will be able to buy it all. The fear was about now the market has found the supply, which was considered to be, uh, you know, gone last time, right? You know, it was closed after 2021. So that supply was not supposed to come back to the market or that's how the pricing of the token has been happening. Now, if 600 plus 600,000 dollars, 600,000 BTC gets unlocked, and if your total supply cut as a result of halving is around, let's say, 150,000 BTC, so that's a huge, you know, supply into the market. So how is the market going to price in this if all of that 600,000 BTC gets into the market, right? So that was the biggest fear. And probably that is also why we saw a huge correction. And we were seeing also ETFs, uh, you know, uh, taking in a lot of uh, corrective format at that point. And then it stabilized for a few days. And then the inflow started to happen. Now, 
that is still happening. The inflows have not stopped, right? Like there are, you know, a little bit of net outflows time to time, but that is common. You, you always need a bit of rebalancing. Funds also do a bit of rebalancing. They, it takes time to move funds around, even if it is a, a big entity. So uh, cool off periods, intermediate cool off periods are common. Now the question continuously remains is that if GPTC unlock, uh, you know, unlock has started to slow down, if their unloading has started to slow down, and if uh, on the spot ETF side the the super mines continue to keep buying even if it is consistent, small amounts, let's say 50 million to 100 million a day, uh, that offsets any of the Moncox based. Uh, sell off that could come that offsets the um, that that is going to anyway eat up a lot of this supply half in cut based narrative that comes in makes it more accelerated. So question comes in over here is like why should it blow off this year and just you know like finish off the bull run this year itself? Why? Unless we have something that happens in the liquidity side in the macro world. BTC by itself has no reason to just top off this year and you know call it a top for this year and just be done with it. We, we need to see more evidence of it. If liquidity keeps coming into the global market and uh, that also translates into ETFs and starts coming in, then there is no reason BTC should stop running. And then we will have to see when that liquidity starts to slow down again. And then we can call for blow off tops and you know like a, a bear market start. But until then, I think as long as the demand keeps coming in, we just have to uh, live to fight another day. I agree with that as well. So we've talked several times about the importance of these flows and the impact that they're, they're going to continue to have on the market. I think last episode, Ben Lilly was talking about the, the impact of the New York session now because of these ETF flows, right? So I, I think to, to go back and give, I guess, my layman's interpretation of what Benjamin just said, yes, there's, there's this potential supply unlock that could have that impact. If we continue to see ETF flows and we don't see something from the, the macro perspective, I think the odds of this blow off top in 2024 are low, right? But obviously the opposite happens. If the ETF flows trickle down, we have this um we have a lack of liquidity coming into the market then obviously that, that that odds can go up it may present some interesting trade opportunities um from my perspective i mean and i want to ask you that benjamin if you do see that if the etf flows stop uh, or they trickle down and you see a liquidity dry up from let's say the macro environment could we see another 2020 COVID style liquidity event which I would argue is is buy of the generation kind of opportunity. Uh, that's uh, that's a hard tell. The COVID style event is very hard to tell. I do not see uh, how we can predict it, to be honest. But one thing I would say, the expectation for the net inflows for ETFs, the super mines, is basically $30 billion. That is the total expectation for this year, all right? Uh, 30, at most it's like 40. And the, the, the theory is that every dollar that comes in on the ETF debit flow, it basically adds $10 to Bitcoin market cap. That is the basic thumb rule over here, all right? So by that logic, if uh, the ETF net inflows reaches 30 to $40 billion by end of this year, that means BDC will be at 90 to 100K. So this is the thumb rule expectation based on the actual inflows that is coming in. Now, uh, when I speak to the market makers who operate on the hedging side for a lot of media flows, uh, they're all quite surprised that there is still in demand, that the ETF demand has not seen a top yet. Now, I believe in this cycle, we we'll probably see uh, uh, two reasons for a blow off top to happen, and then you know a bear market starts to take over. One, rate cuts do not happen at all, and liquidity does, doesn't come into the market at all, uh, and we continue to be on a prolonged um, high rate high, high rate situation. RRBs start to refill again, which basically means liquidity is flowing out of the market once again. Um, makes it a very difficult market. That is one reason. 
But if the ETF market, the spot ETF market, the nines see a topping out situation, if their net inflows start to see uh, tapering after 30 to 40 billion for let's say a couple of months, then that could really signal that we are at the top of the market. When that top happens is when we need to start to worry because uh, let's face it, the harness fact is that retail is not bothered about BTC. Retail is just using BTC as a S&P 500 type of an index right now. It's so expensive for most of APAC to own a single token. It's 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 uh, it's stable enough right now, to be honest. Uh, Twenty percent drawdowns is quite similar to what you get with the Tesla or some other uh, stocks right now, annually speaking. So people are more comfortable just holding BTC spot uh, because most uh, stocks are also performing uh, with the respect to drawdown, same as what BTC does uh, in a bull market. So given that logic, it's become like a stable uh, asset that these people are able to count on. And they want speculative assets to gamble on. That's why you see so many L3, so many L2, so many game fight, uh, AI, deep in, uh, you know, uh, Unibot type of products continue continue to come up because you need something to gamble on. You need something to earn points on. You need something to earn ad drops on. That is probably what where the retail money will consistently keep going in. And the play is this: you know, EDF inflows basically stabilizes the BTC market. As a result of which, everyone else who was holding BTCs outside the ETF market continue to grow rich, and at one point they will decide to start to rotate into other, uh, you know, asset ecosystems, which will end up popping up um, uh, the value of other ecosystems in uh, L1s and L2s and GameFi, all those sites, and alt will run, and the same cycle will continue. Well, Benjamin, uh, let me. Yeah, let, let me let me break in here. So I just want to summarize the, the question initially for all those who are, who are here and listening and thanks for everyone for joining us today was, are we going to see a COVID-like event, a liquidity event? And to summarize what you said, if if the ETF flows continue as they are projected and talking to market makers, they, they, they've been surprised by the amount of flows. And so it's possible that they hit the 30 to 40 million, uh, 30 to 40 billion this year uh that would that would translate into a much higher price and it would really cushion any of that sell off the likelihood of that covid style sell off is is very low but if if that again if those inflows start to dry up they don't actually hit those estimates then uh we we need to be prepared for some kind of drawdown but it, it like the likelihood of a covid style sell off is is probably still very low and obviously something you can't really predict um, but obviously, we'll continue to monitor. Sell -off that, right? is, yeah, COVID side sell off is purely going to be based on macros. It's sure. it's going to be nothing to do with what's happening in crypto, even whether if it is uh, as a result of ETF flows or not. It's purely going to be what happens with the rate situation, the new government that will come in, uh, you know, who's going to be the Fed chair, what is the policy adaptation that is going to be like, uh, rate cuts, of course, and how's the liquidity situation, how's the China situation, how's the dollar index. All the you know regular drama comes into play at that point. Yeah. So it's it's got nothing to do with BTC. BTC has nothing to do with COVID drop or any of the biggest crashes that we have had because all of the crashes were inherently purely liquidity events. And those liquidity events, you cannot look for answers in the charts when it comes to BTC. That sits on all the other metrics uh, that we are building upon in Panda Terminal and in JLabs Digital. Sure. Well, let's, let's take this as an opportunity to pivot and talk a little bit about positioning, setups, and trades. I know there's some questions here. Uh, one of them is coming uh, about the ETH BTC pair. I want to I want to get your guys' take on that, uh, and then other relevant options for future data. Uh, I'd like to get a, a get a sense of that as well. So th let's go to that. Um, before we do, for all those who joined us, thank you for being here. We're here every Tuesday and Thursday. Love having you here. Hit the like and subscribe button. Really helps us get out to as many people as possible. It's a little bit of an algorithm hug. And if you're looking at supporting the show even more, even further. CoinCall is the place to do it. CoinCall is a fantastic exchange where you can trade options, spot, and perps for all the major pairs. It's got an elegant interface and highly competitive fees. We've highlighted several times on the show, and JJ's about to walk through it. 
And of course, it's a great place to start your options journey, which JJ talks a lot about in his trading videos and his education videos. I will do my best to remember to put that in the link in the description for those who are asking, but it is a playlist on this channel. But let's, with that, let's, let's head over and talk a little bit about the actual trade. So JJ, when we talk about setups from an options perspective, what are you seeing now uh, that, that are good plays? Because we, we talked about the market kind of hedging in both directions. So is there anything that you're seeing as a really good play from an options point of view? I don't think you really want to take a strong positional sentiment here until we either see like a move above 52K on strength or ultimately that breakdown below 50. But if you're just looking for a hedge, cheap hedge, I think these March 7th, $48,000 puts, $763, I think that's a pretty good risk reward because if we do see 52K, the premiums on these will likely double or triple in short order. You get a nice return there. And ultimately, like strategically hedging these spots, if we do see the downside move, that allows you to get long in even greater size over the long term, right? So it's like picking your spots where you know a uh, possible mean version is possible. Um, if we see a move above 52K on strength, you could sell these for a small loss. It's just kind of a good risk reward proposition here. You hold this for a day or so, see how these ETF flows play out over the course of the next day, see what the macro does with stocks and what have you. And it's just a good position to sit on for a short amount of time to kind of hedge yourself. You basically, if you have one BTC of exposure, this captured downside at around 47300 or so after you factor in the premium cost. So I think that's a good play if you're looking for a hedge. Uh, in terms of directional plays, I don't see much that's jumping out there just because we're kind of in that no man's land still, just consolidating. So you don't want to get data burned by taking on large call or put positions with a directional bias. Okay. That's a, that's a good breakdown. So I, I, this really echoes some of the sentiment we've been talking about on this show, which is, it, unfortunately, it's a little bit of sitting on your hands. The, the word of the day is patience, and probably the word of the year is patience. Uh, those setups do come, but they may not be here today. Exactly. Um, well, let's let's talk a little bit, and, and Benjamin, I want to bring you in here. Uh, question coming in from Strata Trader. Quote, given the current ETH BTC pair, what levels would you recommend for converting ETH to BTC? And conversely, the scaling back in, are there any particular levels you're watching? And then, of course, the question after that is, are there relevant options or future data? I, I know on this show, just to clarify, we don't give uh, financial advice. None of this is financial advice. This is our commentary. So we can't actually comment uh, too much on any one idea. But I guess from a general perspective, Benjamin, what are you looking at from an ETH BTC pair? Uh, what gives you thoughts on when you're going to be converting from one to the other or maybe even going into stables? Um, right now, the ETH BTC pair seems to me that it has put in a bottom. When I look at the weeklies, uh, it's taken its time, but it, it does feel like, especially the current weekly, how it looks like, it does feel like it has put in a bottom. So right now it is around 0 0.057. And if the market continues to hold, even if BTC remains above 50K, then and it, it basically goes to 3,500 of sort, you know, we could uh, see this skyrocket to 0 0.07 or even a little higher. But overall, not the best time to rotate out of ETH. Um, it's better to hold for now. After a 20, 30 percentage move, we can then see um, on the USCD pair, and then we can see how it looks like in the BTC pair and then make a decision. But for now, I don't see a reason to rotate out of it into BTC. Whether you, if you want to flip into USDT, that's a different question. You know, but if it's between these assets, I don't see a reason to flip out of ETH yet, especially when it is looking like it is actually solidifying the bottom. And maybe we get a few weeks of run over here, um, which can basically do a, July 2023 type or 22 type of a move. Uh, so it's not impossible. I mean, we have the Duncan upgrade as well coming up and Egan layer investment um, from Anderson Horowitz today is a big deal as well. It, it, it solidifies um, the narrative about restaking and the interest and demand in that. So it's very much possible we see a very good ETH rally over the next few weeks. Um, I don't well, think you need to repeat it. Okay. JJ, I want to bring you in here. Uh, we had a different question from JB. RR is not good for BTC, but what about ETH? 
he's showing a lot of strength lately. I guess from your perspective, from a from uh, not so much a rotation between ETH and BTC, but just from a uh, we've talked several times about preparing for the ETH ETF, which we still give a, a generally li higher likelihood given what we've already seen for Bitcoin. Uh, are you looking right now at ETH from a dollar perspective? Is it still just going with the Grayscale Trust? Any perspective there? It's just correlated. <clears throat> so if we see BTC fall below 50K, I think he's going to see a stronger correction back to, say, 2,500 or below. So you just have to be aware of that. Like if the risk reward isn't great on BTC, it's also not great on ETH. So it's more being aware of those scenarios there. And when I look at the ETH BTC, I still don't, I'm not confident that the bottom's in yet. Not to say it can't go higher, but I see like this 0.6 mark as basically pretty strong resistance here. I highly still haven't seen the volumes on either Coinbase or Binance. In terms of what we saw at the uh, previous bottoms, like just how much volume came in on these, when you look at these really big spike ups that mark bottoms long term. So I'm still not completely sold that the bottom's in on the BTC pair. Not that it can't continue to run, uh, say, above 3,200 or so, but I think that's probably a good spot that we'll be topping out for quarter one there. And I would ultimately look to buy back lower before swapping out any... You don't want to FOMO in at the top of this ETH BTC pair. And I don't see any real strong confirmations that the bottom's in yet. I think long term, it'll be up, but I just don't see it yet. That said, the ETH Grayscale Trust, I mean, we've been pointing this out since it was around $12. It just continues to be a free money trade. So just pick up that free money, hedge it if you want to. It's just, I can't believe that it's still at a discount. It, it should be much higher. <laughs> The market's inefficiency is your opportunity. So just take right. note of that. I think it's at around 10% still. So, I mean, that's as good as it gets. You could get basically a 10% discount on your ETH just by buying this and holding it until we get that ETF announcement. So, okay. All right. Wrong. With that, I think those are a couple of positioning ideas for your portfolio. And we're going to wrap up the show. As I look at the markets, we've been talking about waiting and see what happens. Bitcoin's currently trading just above 51K, 51342. And Ethereum back below 3,000, 3, but 2,970. So we're waiting to see which way this is going to turn. But uh, until then, I suggest you check back with us. We're here every Tuesday and Thursday. I want to thank you, JJ, you, Benjamin, for joining me, coming on the show and sharing this alpha. I want to thank everyone for joining us in the chat, giving us those questions to give us a lot to think about, hopefully give you a lot to think about for your portfolio. And as always, I know I sound like a parent. I'm going to leave you with the PSA. Keep some dry powder. These are uncertain times. JJ pointed that out with the options market. We don't know where exactly where it's going to go, and neither does the market. It's positioned for both directions, which means you need to have some dry powder. So be prepared. Check in with us next time. And with that, this is Marconi White. Signing off.